Evet sıradaki oturumumuzun sponsoru The sponsor of this session will be Vodafone and uh, the title of it is the digital future. So in this session we'll be, we will be speaking about how far digitalization would carry companies and societies in future and information about what the technological level will be in the new period will be shared. Coleman Deegan to the, to the platform please. I also would like to send our previous panelists to their platforms. Our new session will be starting. Please, thank you. And right now, I also would like to invite our panelists one by one. Bir kez daha alkışlarınızla. Once again, Mr. Deegan, I would like to invite Mr. Deegan. We'd like to have you on stage, please. and a member of the board, Akbank Hakan Binbashkir, founder of M Factory Ventures, Murat Emirda, and autonomous mobility CEO, Peter Theo Sorgenfrey, and the senior futurist, Da Vinci Institute, Thomas Frey. I wish you a good session. Let's start. Good morning, friends. Welcome. I am. Um, I feel very proud and privileged, uh, but also a little bit nervous. I, and I'll tell you why I'm nervous, is because this panel is the panel that's keeping you from your lunch. But the reason I'm feeling very optimistic, and we should always feel optimistic when we talk digital, I think, is because we're going to do this in a very digital way and manage this panel in uh, agile, fast, uh, quick, data-driven, uh, because we have a great panel. And I think uh, we'll all benefit from hearing their stories, their wisdom, their advice, 
um, a great team. So, you know, the other thing to say that we're having this in probably one of the most digitalized uh, countries in the world. And uh, I say that coming from the telecom sector, where I see the usage, of internet usage, and the variety of usage and the growth of usage very, very strong. So over, as we benchmark Turkey against other markets, it's far, far ahead. And you will see some of the participants today who are actually working in that on a daily basis and leading, uh, leading from the front in terms of digitalization. We also have some great speakers coming from abroad who are doing really amazing things, have done amazing things, are doing amazing things, and will do amazing things. So I think uh, I will uh, get stuck in straight away. Um, our first, uh, on my left here, is uh, Dan Kotke. Now, Dan, um, I think he could have even retired after 1979 or 1980. He, uh, he had achieved... He had, <laughs> he had achieved a lot in his life even by then because uh, uh, Dan was, uh, what number into Apple, uh, uh, Dan? I was, I was uh, either no, the first, the second, the third, or the fourth, yeah. or the twelfth, depending on how you count. Well, so uh, I guess uh, one of the first people into Apple, so, uh, and has since uh, become a, an entrepreneur focusing, uh, I guess, on, in this IoT, into the smart home. So we will hear a little bit more about that. Yes. But I can't have a guy who has been the first, one of the first into Apple. And I'm sorry, I, this is a bit like, you know, when they ask the Rolling Stones, they have to play the, the hits from the 60s and 70s. But uh, please <laughs> tell us a little bit about how all that started, how you see it today, um, and just some of uh, your, 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 your reminiscences. Thank you, Kalman. Kalman, let me just get this uh, microphone okay here. Um, all right, so I'm very happy to be here. I had no idea this was such a large conference. This is only the second time I have ever spoken on a stage about Steve Jobs. Why? Because he was ferociously private, and I was his friend from a very early time, and I wanted to respect his privacy. Um, so just to give you a little background, I met Steve in the first month of freshman year at Reed College, just on campus. Beginning of freshman year is like for many of us, first time you've been away from home. It's uh, an important time of life, open to many new ideas. I became a vegetarian that month. And, and in fact, so did Steve. Steve and I actually originally connected over macrobiotics. We were both Zen macrobiotics. We discovered the Krishna Temple in Portland, that they had a free Indian food feast every <laughs> Sunday night. And so my early friendship with Steve was hitchhiking to the Krishna Temple for Indian food. Um, but really what sparked my friendship with him was the book Be Here Now, written by a guy named Ram Das. How many people here ever heard of that book? Maybe, th nobody, okay, three. Anyway, uh, well, Richard Alpert, Tim Leary, studying psychedelics. Tim Leary went to jail, Richard Alpert ran out of funding and went to India to find a holy man and the rest is history. He wrote a book called Be Here Now. It was only $3. I bought it, and I had never... I was a voracious reader in high school, reading science fiction, never exposed to any kind of spiritual literature, really. And Be Here Now was fascinating because it was a fresh book. Anyway, Steve, of, I was carrying the book around. Of all the people I met, in the early part of that year, Steve was the one who was the most curious and interested to talk about these topics. So in rapid succession, he and I read the Be Here Now book and Autobiography of a Yogi, that's Paramahansa Yogananda, and then we read Ramakrishna and his devotees, his disciples, that is. 
We read Way Over the White Clouds about the Tibetan reincarnation. We read Chogyam Trungpa, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. We read Alan Watts. Okay, so that was my friendship with Steve. Um, the funny thing is he never, ever talked about technology at all. Not even a clue. Two years later, he had already dropped out and started working at Atari, making video games. And he and I went to India for four months to go to the Kumbh Mela, which was the biggest religious gathering. So that was a disappointment because, well, 20, 30 million people. Steve was too impatient to wait for me to arrive in India. So he went ahead by himself. I joined him later. So we traveled around India for several months. Really nothing much happened. We didn't find a guru. Certainly not a guru who was going to change our lives. But it was a life-changing experience for the same reason that travel in general is good. For the same reason that I am really enjoying being here, exposed to the Turkish culture. I really had no idea. So I, I, what I often say to people is, to young people, young people should travel and see the world because, well, I don't know, speaking for myself, in the United States, we have a narrow view in our media about what's going on in the world. Anyway, Apple didn't, so 1975, I stayed in touch with Steve. 1975, he and I went to this commune in Oregon to manage the apple harvest. And at the time, Steve was interested in the fruitarian diet, Arnold Errett, uh, rational fasting. So we were fasting on apples. That's where the name apple came from. It was the next year, well that was 1975, it was the next year that Steve Wozniak had created the Apple One prototype and since I had stayed in touch with Steve, I offered to come help him. Now the really remarkable thing about Apple that is not well known is that the Apple One was just a prototype. It wasn't really what you would call a consumer product. And um, unlike most startups, right off the bat, they got a purchase order for $50,000 worth of Apple One circuit boards. That was 50 boards. And that's highly unusual. So Apple was very fortunate in, in getting a large purchase order right off the bat. And what can you say? But Steve Jobs was smart enough and ambitious enough to not lose his place in the market. The early computer market was extremely competitive. There were dozens of startup companies. And it was far from clear in the early days that Apple would prevail. And at this point in time, you could say Apple might well have failed in the late 90s. In fact, it would have. If Steve Jobs hadn't come back, Apple was going to be sold to some other company and gone away, probably. Anyway, let's see, where are we in the timeline? Uh, I, so I was the only person who worked on the Apple One in the garage. In fact, I was the only person who worked in the garage. Why? Because Steve was in the kitchen all the time, which is where the phone was. So, you know, Apple's famous for starting in a garage, but really the company started in the kitchen if you will. Uh, Steve and I wrote the first brochure for the Apple One on the kitchen table uh, based on advertising that we saw from Intel. And um, anyway, I worked on the Apple II, I worked on the Apple III, I worked on the Apple IV. Um, I had a hard time in the early years. I had a degree in music from, I dropped out of Reed I finished my music degree at Columbia just at the time I was starting at Apple. So I'm a self-taught engineer. I'm a good engineer at this point, but for many years I was behind the curve as a technician. I did not get a stock option at Apple. I'm not a wealthy venture capitalist. Um, I've done all right. In fact, up, up until the last 10 years, I made more money in real estate than in, in high tech because I invested in a series of houses in Palo Alto area and the real estate there has done very well. 
Anyway. So there's still money in blocks and mortar, you're saying, uh, Dan? There's still money in blocks and yeah, mortar. Bricks and mortar, bricks yes. And mortar, yeah. Yes. Well, actually, the real estate in Silicon Valley, San Francisco in particular, yeah. it's, it's a problem. It's actually... You should come to Istanbul. <laughs> okay, I like that idea. Anyway, um, maybe to sum up that phase of my life, um, so many people have asked me to write a memoir of our travels in India, which I was not eager to do because really nothing much happened. But then the idea came to me that I'm the world expert on the two dozen books that Steve and I were reading that made us want to go to India. And that's an interesting topic. So what we're talking about here is all of the, in the early 70s, before Apple started, there were um, two dozen gurus who in the, in the social culture, and it was just hard to know what to think about any of them. And now that it's 40 years later, I thought, well, okay, we could like have a retrospective here. So that's what I'm gonna aim to do. Fantastic. Yeah. Good. And, um, okay, well. Maybe, maybe I'll, if uh, I can ask you to just uh, hold your thoughts and maybe uh, I will come back to you because okay. I, I will move along. But Good. fascinating. I, you should have come last because how would you follow the guy that was the second guy into Apple? But yeah. anyway, we are going to match that and even uh, uh, make it even superior because next we have uh, in our panel Daria. Daria is the uh, Turkey country manager uh, for Facebook. Um, uh, a very, uh, and has been since 2015. Uh, so Daria, uh, please give us some insight, if you can, about uh, Facebook, uh, maybe in Turkey, also in the global context of how, uh, you know, the, the impact it's having for businesses, for customers, for the society in general. I would start from, uh, you know, um, talking about the overall impact on the economy. And uh, so economy, specifically Turkey, like the, uh, pardon, I'm sorry. Turkey. Sorry. Sorry. When I actually had the question in English, then uh, that's why I actually continued in English. Apologies. Well, when we think about the economies, the backbone of an economy are the SMEs, the small and medium scaled enterprises. And if you ask me what is the impact of the Facebook to the economy, then I do believe that Facebook is enabling the SMEs to go beyond their borders. And how can we do that? I can give you some examples from uh, Turkey. Two kids actually come together and they are developing programs and all of a sudden they can uh, become one of the big companies in Turkey, which is called One Nation. And they, maybe you have heard about it, Pig Games from the game sector. It is actually uh, being established by those entrepreneurs. And they are also one of our biggest customers uh, in the gaming sector. Well, when I started to work as the country manager and when I had the chance to work with the SMEs, I really understand that Facebook is a very important platform which enables those SMEs to go beyond their borders. And this is actually a, a very remarkable story for the startups. Of course, we are bringing a lot of innovations, and those innovations are developing each year. Today, we are not working as the marketing partner for those companies, but we are also the business partners because the sales are going on through Facebook, and we are also giving customer services with thanks to our uh, messaging system. Uh, Mr. Hakan, for example, is with us, uh, and together uh, with Akbank, uh, uh, we have actually collaborated and 30% of their customers are reaching to them through Facebook. And we are also present in the retail sector and with our new uh, solutions, uh, actually we can uh, make an analysis, for example, how many people can uh, take their steps inside to their uh, shops. And I can also give an example from automobile sector. There is this uh, concept, lead generation, the uh, acquiring of the potential uh, customers uh, for the earning uh, scores, for example. 
in this, uh, we are collaborating with those companies and through Facebook we are selling trucks and also uh, automobiles and as this technology is developing we are serving as a platform for, for those companies to go beyond borders and we are actually enabling them to be much more efficient and productive. I can summarize our impact as such. Thank you, Daria. Uh, next, uh, I will come to Hakan Bish, uh, bin Bashkil. Hakan, um, and for our international uh, uh, members here, um, I would say I've been in, living in Turkey 18 months now. The uh, retail banking sector is at the forefront of development, digitalization, really, really, uh, really uh, groundbreaking stuff. Um, and Hakan is the CEO of one of the leading banks, Akbank. And we discussed earlier that this journey began in 2006, before the iPhone, I think, came on the scene in 2007. So Hakan, maybe you can enlighten us with a little bit of the Akbank journey so far into digitalization, where you are today, how you think about digitalization as a part of your core strategy. First of all, thank you very much, Coleman. Maybe rather than focusing on the banking sector, the biggest responsibility of ours is to read and interpret the trends and set up the right vision. It doesn't matter in which sector you are. It might be the banking sector, it might be the telecommunication sector. To be able to read the trends and interpret them is really essential for a sustainable success. Before I come here, I just take a look to certain companies. There were many companies who were quite successful in the past, but they are not existed anymore. BlackBerry, for example, one of the most successful uh, companies in the past. And they told that, uh, I mean, the companies are actually trusting our solutions, and they said that BlackBerry said that Android and iPhone will never penetrate into our customer profile, they say. They have such a high level of trust, but we can say that they are not existed anymore. Kodak, for example, said that although we actually developed the digital, the uh, people will always choose the old school, Nokia. Our phones are the global standards and Blockbuster said that people do not like to watch movies online, they said. Well, I mean, uh, if you have such a high level of trust in yourself, then you can actually uh, find yourself in a pathetic situation. Well, the banks are uh, also very important and without the trust, the banks cannot actually survive. But the innovation and technology, such kind of issues are also very important for us. And uh, I can also say that as the banks, every year we are investing $150 million for technology and digitalization, and the next year we will be investing $300 million because we have to follow those trends and our uh, I mean, customers are changing. Facebook, WhatsApp, Apple, Instagram, I mean, Customer profile is also changing and their behaviors and attitudes are changing and the banks should respond to that, those changing behaviors. For example, if a person is used to WhatsApp and Facebook, they also would like to communicate with us with the, day, with the way they are communicating with those programs. And you have to be mobile, you have to respond instantly. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of those topics are actually at the core of the agenda and the banks are among the most important users of such concepts. Let me give you a couple of statistics. 95% of our transactions are actually being carry out, carried out out of our branches. Branches are really important but they are doing different things. Well, in order to adapt ourselves to the world, we are doing remarkable things, especially in the recent years, we have established an innovation lab. And we are following and tracing the trends which might be feasible in our case. After defining them, it might be coming from Silicon Valley, 
we are cooperating with the companies uh, from the Silicon Valley in the uh, other parts of the world. And we are evaluating those ideas three times or four times in a year. And we are testing those ideas and we are trying to implement them. This actually brings innovation culture to a different point and the banks are adapting uh, the technologies even faster. As a result, this is the trend and this is what we have to do and that's what we are trying to do. And I also have to say that the country is also uh, helping us because the uh, population of the Turkey is quite young and I'm sure that you are also observing it. This young population is also embracing such kind of innovations and this is actually a luck for us because the, the return on investments are quite fast. I can say a lot of, a lot of things but maybe on the second round. Thank you, uh, thank you Hakan Bey. Uh, next to Hakan Bey we have uh, Morad Emirat. Morad uh, is uh, uh, an, uh, I guess an internet, uh, internet born uh, I guess <laughs> native. Uh, born in Turkey, now lives in the U.S. mostly, but uh, has an, an international advisory firm, has worked for uh, Microsoft, various roles, Zynga, Instacart in the past, and now splits his time between uh, U.S. and Turkey advising uh, companies how to digitalize, exploit the, the digital wave. So, Morat, maybe you can uh, help us a little bit, uh, tell us some about these trends uh, that are ongoing, and you know, particularly with a focus on Turkey. What is happening, what, what should be happening, or what can be happening? Uh, thank you so much for the kind intro. Uh, Hakan Bey, we are able to speak about 300 million dollars. Let's speak Hakan Bey for a while. Uh, okay, I'm going to speak on the venturing side. I feel myself a little bit lucky because in this transformation evolution process on the internet, I was uh, able to watch it very closely in Microsoft in the first online uh, productions and uh, products and also services having used hot mails and messengers and search engine beings and so on being involved and during Zynga time the game revolution and social games on Facebook also mobile revolution mobile games and applications have started to take place Instacart and big data and mobile technologies have been united joint forces and a general the retailing business has totally changed and many things have been experienced very closely by myself and later on I feel myself very lucky and I see that these trends are being experienced from the first hand on one side it is very hard to estimate what will be happening and on the other side you are facing with the opportunities if you take the right action at the right time you're able to catch the opportunity especially in specific about Turkey I would like to speak about a few things all of the projects I have mentioned, all of the investment and venturing business that I'm carrying on, and my global business uh, fields are, of course, uh, beating our hearts, making our heart beat in Turkey. Let me uh, think from Turkey. I'm very honored to be a part, but uh, seeing that such kind of things are being carried on, I would like to mention our good experiences on the professional side and on the social responsible side. I need to speak. Hepsibrada.com. I'm an executive board. And when I'm involved in the structure, I've seen that it is possible to create a digital value in the global measures. And Hans Heide and Gunit really uh, did a very great job. And this is one of the success stories which has come out from Turkey. And later on, when we look from outside, Borusan Holding, for example, do have a similar relationship. I've seen that Agah Bey and his team. Uh, in this industrial business, uh, they have internalized the digital transformation and they have started to implement their new digital model. After seeing all of these, I have recognized the potential in Turkey more. And in this entrepreneurship ecosystem, there is a very active generation coming. In the Silicon Valley and the other countries in, in North, South America and Asia, we do have very good entrepreneurs. And, uh, People are seeking for zones outside Turkey and they need to, they would like to carry on global businesses and this is something right. There are two social responsibility projects and I'll be passing the ball to my next speaker. One of them is Hamdi Dukaya. With Hamdi Dukaya we are carrying on this project. Uh, and there, Hamdi Dukaya Entrepreneurship is the name of the project. It is seeking for the entrepreneurs who are not able to reach the right sources 
this is a social project aiming to reach those people and bring fun to them. The project which I'm speaking is a very rooted association. It is uh, trying to support the economical development and incentives every year in NASDAQ in New York about innovation and entrepreneurship. We are carrying on some summit events. It's a non-profit organization. Uh, we would like to create funds for the projects in Turkey. Our main objective is uh, bringing forth the academicians, entrepreneurs, innovators, and bringing them to a common platform and make it sustainable for the future projections. If you optimize in the right place, in the right way, we can bring more success stories. Let me stop here. In the next turn, I will be coming with a lot of data. That's enough. Thanks, Morat. Uh, sitting next to Morat is uh, Peter Sorgenfrey. Peter is uh, all the way from Copenhagen. Um, now, uh, one thing uh, that is becoming more and more, Peter's had many, many years experience, but I guess the automotive industry is probably where he has focused most of his time, um, and the whole area of uh, autonomous mobility. Um, and Peter is heavily involved in that in the Nordic um, and Baltic region, over eight countries. He, his company um, de develops uh, autonomous uh, mobility. So, Peter, is this a fad or is this here for good? That's a question that we all have. And then tell us what you're doing and where it's going to go a little bit, would be in this whole area, because it's, uh, there's a lot of, we, we hear a lot around it. Thank you, and thanks for having me. So before I start answering that question, I'll tell you where I'm coming from. Because I work for a company that could have been Kodak or Blackberry or one of these companies that Hakan mentioned. We've been selling cars for the last 100 years. We're a family-owned business, and 25% of all the cars on the road in the eight countries that I operate in are sold by us. So when something happens in the automotive industry that might change the way that people are buying and using vehicles, it's our business that's changing. So three years ago, we sat down and we did a strategic process and said, how are people going to move from A to B in the future if they're not going to be moving in a car? We saw car sharing programs coming online in the United States and in Europe. Uh, we saw young people not taking driver's licenses as much as they used to. Where I live, it's at 18 years old. Increasingly, kids weren't taking driver's licenses. And we saw parents that normally would buy a vehicle for their kids said, we're not buying an extra car because he or she doesn't want it. They see it as a liability to have their own car. Where should I park it? The insurance, gasoline, it pollutes. This is not what I want to do. So we saw this seismic shift. And so what we decided, and what we decided right then and there was the future of transportation and mobility was going to be increasingly shared. So either at the same time, so Murad and I could go together in the car, or we would share a car so that when he wasn't using it, I would be using it. We saw that cars increasingly are going to be electric. Electrification is a big trend that's happening in transportation. And we saw that cars increasingly are going to be autonomous. Many of you probably drive personal cars that have adaptive cruise control, so you can keep the distance to the people in front of you, lane warning assist, those kind of systems. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, getting air conditioning in your car was a feature. Today, it's standard. The same thing with seat belts, the same thing with electric windows. All that is happening on autonomy. So what are we doing? Right now, we started 15 months ago, 16 months ago, October 2016. We're operationally in eight countries. We're the world's largest owner of autonomous vehicles. We've been in business for 16 months. We've done this because the family that I represent invested and bought all these vehicles. Then we went to cities and municipalities that are struggling with congestion. I drove in Istanbul yesterday. There are too many cars. There's too much traffic. They're struggling with pollution because a lot of diesel and gasoline engines are standing idle in the streets. And they're struggling with traffic deaths. Way too many people get hurt in traffic today because when we're driving, not all of us are paying attention because we're looking on our phones, talking to our partner, eating, putting on makeup, doing whatever we're doing, but we're not driving. 
So all these things, these cities want to alleviate. So we started selling our solutions of autonomous shuttles to all these cities. In Denmark, the country I'm from, there's 98 municipalities, 98 cantons, regions. 86 of them signed on in the first three months. They said, we want to have this in our cities. We want to eliminate cars from our cities. I want to encourage people to drive together autonomously and in electric vehicles. So I don't think it's a fad. In fact, um, around the world, autonomous vehicles are being designated as the world's largest development project. It is estimated that the world at more it comes from 9 billion US dollars are invested in new companies that didn't exist five years ago that are focusing on autonomous vehicles. By last count, you have all the major automotive manufacturers, so Mercedes, Renault, BMW, you know them all. All of those, that's roughly 70 brands, if you count all the big ones, plus 125 new companies that you've never heard of that decided they wanted to build something that could drive by itself, being propelled by electricity. That many people and that much money can't be wrong. So we certainly believe it's the future. I've told my shareholders that 20 years from now, we're not selling cars. Remember, we're selling 25% of all the cars on the road today. 20 years from now, we're not selling cars. 10 years from now, nobody in this room, if you live near a major city, will need to own a car. You will not need it, you might want to. 30 years from now, many places you're not going to be allowed to drive yourselves. The city that you're driving next to will have instituted system that says, if you want to drive close to our cyclists, pedestrians, other people in traffic, the car has to do it for you. I think I have to stop there and uh, take questions in the next round. Wow, well I think <clears throat> that has certainly got the attention um, so thank you, uh, thanks Peter for that and definitely we will come back to you a little, to develop those thoughts a little bit more. At the, at the very end there we have uh, Thomas Frey. Thomas, welcome. Uh, Thomas uh, is uh, from uh, Colorado in the US but has come, he told me, just from Melbourne uh, via Abu Dhabi uh, to be here today. So he, <laughs> he is uh, a, a person of great uh, uh, wisdom in the whole area of digitalization, but in particular in artificial intelligence, um, and has spent many years uh, studying, developing, uh, uh, talking about that. And maybe for our audience, uh, Thomas, and not to be too uh, basic, but maybe you can explain a little what is actually artificial intelligence, what it does, and what is the potential of that? Um, well, artificial intelligence is uh, a lot of different sciences that have been worked on for many decades and they're all kind of coming together. It's a combination of machine learning and language recognition and object recognition and, and all of these things are kind of coming together and we're putting it into neural networks that, that uh, kind of learn as they go and that's really a, a way too simplistic a definition for it. Um, uh, Three years ago, I proposed the idea that uh, for us to understand artificial intelligence, we should actually have some sort of a measuring system. So I suggested we create a new form of measurement called the human intelligence unit. Um, similar to um, uh, horsepower or if you're measuring um, video projectors, the lumens in a video projector, so, so a way of measuring it. Um, so right now, artificial intelligence, we're, we're still way at the bottom. We're probably 0.5% um, uh, of what a human intelligence is right now. We have a long ways to go. We're seeing lots of headlines that are coming out that are giving us um, kind of a false reading, if you will, on the overall state of the industry. And, and while we create artificial intelligence that's really good at one task, uh, overall, it's still deficient in so many different ways. Now, that's going to change over the coming years. Um, <clears throat> and, a, and a lot of people instantly jump to, um, you, you know, 20, 30 years from now, um, worrying about whether their job will go away because of artificial intelligence. And 
it's, uh, they, they tend to break it up into categories like it's humans versus artificial intelligence, it's humans versus robots, when actually it's humans and artificial intelligence and human and robots that work together. Um, and, and together we can, we can actually accomplish so much more. All of this technology gives us additional capabilities and over a lifetime we'll be able to, to accomplish 10 times, 20 times, 50 times uh, what the average person can today, eventually. But we, we have lots of stages to go through. So whenever we have a new technology, we have to work our way through the crappy stages before we get to the really good stuff. And we're, we're not there yet. We still have a long ways to go in, in getting to the good stuff. Um, artificial intelligence is being used in, um, in little different ways here and there. I'll give you a couple quick examples. Uh, John Deere is a big farm equipment company. They've developed an artificial intelligence system for their spraying units where they apply herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, and things like that. So when they're spraying a field, they are now able to recognize what's a plant and what's a weed. And they can use uh, laser pinpoint application so they can just spray the, the herbicide right on the weed itself. And it leaves the, the chemicals off of the plants. That's, that's a, a really good use of artificial intelligence there. Um, I've been speculating on artificial intelligence being used to develop the next level of search engines. Uh, over the coming years, we're gonna see lots of flying drones and lots of sensors, and this gives us the ability to create digital models of spaces, of cities, and we'll be able to do searches then on attributes that we don't even understand today. We'll be able to search on things like textures and tastes and smells and harmonic vibrations and specific gravities, levels of reflectivity. Only we don't have to know how it's doing the searching, just that they're getting the right results. So we will in the future be able to put in a search query into a search engine and find out where is that dog with rabies in my city today? What's the most dangerous intersection in my city today? A search engine for the physical world, I think, changes so many different things. And artificial intelligence is giving us the tools to create that. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over. Wow. What a, I think that was the starter. We'll be back for the main course uh, shortly. But uh, that's a, a great uh, introduction. Uh, to artificial intelligence and uh, I can only speak from uh, a telecoms company, tele technology, and we have uh, the whole floor here. We are using artificial intelligence now to drive more and more and more of our decision making. Um, and what Thomas referred to probably show me the most dangerous intersection. Already we're using that sort of type of language or questioning through AI machine learning to tell me how to sell the product for the best price, tell me where to sell it to the, uh, to the customer that needs it, not to sell it to the customer that doesn't need it. This is becoming now part and parcel of our daily, uh, daily business. So for sure I can, we can all recognize uh, the trend you're on uh, or the trend you're outlining and it will go further. Um, let me bring it back uh, to Dan. So you're, uh, you're now, um, after 40 years uh, or so, sorry to mention timing, but uh, you, you're now in, uh, spending your time in uh, consumer IoT, into smart homes. Can you tell us a little bit about that and where you think it's going to go? And why, why you're there? Why do you like that? Why are you putting your, your, your hard-earned money from Palo Alto there? Hello? Okay, so um, I was living in a group house with Steve Jobs back in the 70s. Somehow I just um, never managed to live on my own. I've always been a land, I, I was managing group houses. In fact, the group house I was in with Steve, he, Steve was never there. So I was collecting the rents and dealing with the housemates. For many years now, I have been eager for a number of things in, of the smart home nature that are aimed at multi-tenant, which in particular would be power monitoring and shared appliances like the washer dryer and the spa that cost money. 
And although the smart home is a big industry in the United States, I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but it's pretty much all targeted at where the most profit is, which is the luxury homes. So think about the Nest, which is hugely overpriced. Mm. And, and, and the Nest smoke alarm also is $150. So I'm going to make a smoke alarm for $15. It's not that hard. Now, so anyway, that's my basic outlook is that I'm making smart home servers aimed at the multi-tenant sector, which includes co-housing, which is big here in Europe. It includes retirement communities. It includes tiny home communities, which is a huge growth topic in the United States, at least in the Bay Area. And so uh, people with tiny homes can have happy lives, but they're sharing a utility account. They're sharing numbers of things. And so you have to measure how much someone is using and, and charge them accordingly. So I would just say it's not rocket science, but there is no actor in the smart home field that is really addressing that market. So that's what appealed to me. I've been, a, I, I had a huge real estate investment eight years ago that went badly. Uh, we bought a dormant resort that had 160 rooms and 75 cabins. Mm. And as the engineer on the team, I was doing the electronic door locks and the power monitoring and the solar thermal spa. And although that project went badly, those are the same kinds of things I'm doing now. So the last thing I'll mention is that um, philosophically, well, let me put it this way. The general public does not realize that all of the smart home servers, they're not servers, they're routers, okay? All of the smart home products are essentially cloud-based mm. and the customers don't even realize that. And so when you think of a smart home with a programmable switch that does multiple things, when your internet connection fails or the server in the cloud fails, you don't have a smart home anymore. So my philosophy is I'm aiming at standalone servers that need the cloud for configuration, but will work okay without the cloud. Hmm. Now, once I got deeply into Linux, oh my gosh. So um, I've had, I'm having to backpedal a bit. Linux is just very complicated because it's open source and there are many issues. Anyway, I'm not, um, offering a standalone server quite yet, but that is my goal. Um, relative to other things I do, um, I ran a talk show for seven years based on uh, consciousness topics. Um, I'm just mentioning that because I'm still interested in video production, so yeah. mm, why yeah. do I mention that? I don't know. Anyway, I'm also building <laughs> Apple One replicas now because, yeah, so you laugh. No, the no, Apple, I, like, I think because nostalgia is still a huge, right. um, uh, a huge driver of, of demand. So that's when, right. when Peter says uh, we won't, may not need to drive a car, I don't know. I think people will still want to uh, reminisce people, about, you know, what... Uh, people uh, will still be building uh, uh, Model T replicas. The Ford Model T. <laughs> anyway, here's another topic I'll mention. Um, there's a huge revolution in healthcare going on of the shift from doctor-centric to patient-centric medical records. I don't know what the climate is in Europe, but in the United States, there's a huge controversy over our healthcare, and there's a large movement of taking control of your medical data. Well, where should that data live? It should be on your server at home. It shouldn't be on your smartphone. It's nice to access it from your smartphone. And it should not belong to the doctor. It should belong to you. You could store it in the cloud, but the cloud's really better for backup. You want to keep your archival medical records on a machine in your house. And is that your tablet? No. It could be if you, desktop machines are becoming obsolete. So what's the next choice? Well, the smart home server is, is a good choice. So I spend a fair amount of time aiming at that idea. Super. Well, thanks for that. We'll, we will come back to wrap up. Um, I'll move along. Deria, um, Facebook is probably one of the most innovative uh, companies. Uh, lots of 
new <laughs> products and services. Tell us a little bit about what is, uh, what is happening and how we can apply maybe to the Turkish market, to the mm -hmm. Turkish customer, consumer. Well, the, with regards to innovation, we have a research indeed. We actually researched the trends for 2020, and I can summarize it under four different uh, subcategories. One of them is the connectivity. The second important one is the commerce. And the third one is the communication. I mean, how we are accessing to our customers. And the fourth one is the culture. And I can say that the culture matters the most. Let me start speaking uh, by connectivity. The mobile changed our life drastically. Because when we wake up, we just take a look to our mobile phones. And before we go to bed, we take a look to our mobile phone. In today's world, there are more mobile phones than toothbrush. And if you ask, uh, actually, the young generation whether they can survive with our, their, without their mobile phone, they uh, actually prefer their uh, actually finger to be cut. So I always ask uh, many uh, participants, and every, uh, whether you are doing your business with your mobile phone or not, over 50% of them are saying that we are doing our jobs with our mobile phones. And, of course, uh, our job is on the mobile parts by 90%. And what will be the next step? If you ask me this question, maybe we will be going on a trajectory for uh, virtual reality. And we spoke about commerce at the same time. Almost 50% of the transactions are going on through mobile because sometimes we are checking the uh, price of the product and this immersive uh, commerce is actually gaining ground. So we have to uh, target our customers not only through our shops but also through our mobile websites. And when we were using desktops in the past, we were actually seeking for things and searching for things. But today, people are not searching for uh, products, but the products are finding people. Especially for these new marketing techniques, we are understanding who can actually ask for this product. And this is actually just the opposite of how it was in the past. And our way of communication is changing. For example, your phone is not ringing because all the time we are communicating through messages. And in addition to that, in the past we were sending texts. And if you are, for example, using Facebook, you were just writing how Italy is beautiful. But right now we are communicating with the pictures because a picture can tell more things than actually a text can tell about. And of course, the, when you are targeting the visual memory of human beings, uh, the, uh, actually, the brain of a human being can process this data 60,000 more than a simple text. Right now, we are using videos and we are using live videos. We are going with the augmented reality and maybe we will continue with the virtual reality. And this is the case for the communication sector as well. Culture. I believe culture is a topic that I have been speaking all the time. Rather than speaking about Facebook, I am always discussing how we can adapt our culture to this digital transformation. I believe the majority of the Silicon Valley companies have a similar, or, or at least will have similar cultures and similar values. Uh, being agile, being open, focusing on the impact and effect which requires prioritization and at the same time creating a social value. These are our values actually as the company. And when we think about the global perspective, the online population of the world is approximately 2.1 billion. 
In order to manage such a complexity, you have to be open. I mean, how you can share so much information with different departments, how you will prioritize uh, your, how you will actually put in order your priorities. So the traditional companies who are trying to digitalize themselves, I believe, are focusing on the culture and how they can adapt their business culture to this digital transformation. Well, innovation is existed in the first three pillars of this transformation process, but it is really important to embrace this culture. In Facebook, we have a saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yes, indeed. It's a Peter Drecker uh, saying, and I can sum up. Thank you. Um, uh, moving on, Hakan Bey, we talked a little bit about uh, digital um, in banking. Uh, where do you see the trends? Where is it going? Um, you know, opportunities, even threats with this intermediation, blockchain technology, which we haven't discussed, we discussed a little bit earlier, but it would be fascinating to get your views as a, a leader in, in, in the banking space, in the financial yeah. services. Well, I tried to mention in the previous round, but there is such a, a fast change. I mean, 75% of the transactions are going on on the mobile side. The individual loan and their sales, approximately 65% of them are being carried out on the mobile side. And as you told us, 15% of them are going on uh, through Facebook. So what we are trying to do, maybe I can focus on this topic. Our biggest responsibility is to find the right strategy and right vision. If we want to sustain our success, this will be the biggest responsibility of the management, uh, finding the right trends and interpret them in the right manner. We have two topics actually. One of them is the technology. We have to be perfect in that regard. And I totally agree with Ms. Daria, HR and cultural change. We are spending uh, extraordinary time for this culture issue, trend, technology, and HR, and the cultural change. For HR, uh, of course, we uh, have this brand value. We are one of the most important banks in Turkey. But at the same time, we have to adapt our staff to the future because we have 14,000 employees. And we are lucky because if you take a closer look to the profile of our staff, the average age is 35. And 10% of our staff is having, is holding MA and PhD degrees as, uh, as well, and these are quite important, artificial intelligence, uh, data analytics, so these kind of topics are gaining ground, and as a result of that, the staff profile is changing. And right now, the branches, the traditional bank branches are changing. In the Karaköy vicinity, in Istanbul, if you would like to see what will happen to the traditional uh, branch of the banks, I really would like you to visit this Galata branch of our bank. I mean, in time, and for the first time something like that will happen in Turkey, each branch of Akbank will be just like the branch of Galata. So, right now, for example, we, have you, we are using new technologies in that uh, branch, uh, but what will happen to our staff who are actually working on the branches? They are going through training and they are doing uh, different jobs because only 5% of our customers are coming to the branches and when they come they are not withdrawing 
uh, or adding uh, money. They are only consulting to us. Maybe they are going to get some credit. So the value added services are gaining the ground and as a result we are orienting our friends, our colleagues to be competent in those sectors. Most probably you are accustomed to go to a bank and the customer uh, can actually wait in line to speak with the bank uh, personnel, but there is not such kind of way of doing business in the Galata branch. Daniel, maybe we have a common point with you. So this uh, branch is also in correlation with the Apple designer. Everybody is standing, nobody is sitting, eating Apple store. Who designed the Apple store abroad? And we are using the similar concepts because the uh, consumer behaviors are very similar. Uh, I mean, when a customer actually is entering to our branch, we are also making use of those analytical tools, but we are actually uh, meeting our customers when we, st when we stand. Uh, I mean, we are getting away from this uh, platform. Everybody is using such kinds of uh, tools. and. Such kind of traditional, uh, actually, uh, boards and traditional way of uh, doing business is actually changing. And we are not using uh, papers, and this banking sector is changing as well. You asked for blockchain. Thank you very much. Uh, well, this is not only going to change the banking sector, but many other sectors, because blockchain is a very important topic. We have to be patient. Uh, with blockchain and we have started to test it and blockchain became popular but uh, we have started this collaboration two years ago or three years ago uh, even uh, we uh, ripple for example a blockchain company from ripple we started to transfer money for example and uh, with Germany we started to do that and for the first time something like that happens in Turkey and we are collaborating with the international banks and the blockchain issue can actually lead us to a very different point but it has to be disseminated and when it is over uh, actually it's going to be something uh, unique and our customers will actually benefit from this because it, it is going to be much more secure, much more transparent. But we have to be patient because it is not possible for only one bank to do this. The whole system in the globe should change and embrace it. But I'm quite excited about it, I have to say. And you can understand from my body moves. And away from blockchain being uh, in, in banking clearing in the sort of well with, your, with our branch uh, in the Germany we are doing this but if you are speaking about the whole money transfer going uh, through blockchain for that we have a lot to go but we are uh, testing it with Santander and such kind of uh, big banks and when it is becoming much more popular hopefully in the f near future we will be able to do that as well but we well next year I cannot say I cannot say that next year every money transfer will be carried out in blockchain but everybody is investing on it so there are lots of companies who are investing in this big technology and many of the banks are spending a lot of time for that. And this innovation is quite critical. Well, we are reaching out to different points and you can be sure that we will give you better service. Maybe I'm too excited. It's very hard not to be excited about digital. Um, and we've talked about some technologies, blockchain, maybe in the financial services sector. We've talked about autonomous uh, mobility. Uh, enabled by uh, connectivity digitalization. Uh, maybe I'll move along to Morat because you have, uh, as part of you know, your life in Silicon Valley, but also as a member of the uh, World Economic uh, Future Council, you've, uh, you've studied quite significantly some of these trends where we're going. So maybe you can help us guide us a little bit to the, to the future on that or how you see it uh, developing. Çok teşekkürler. Bu tam milyon dolarlık soru dedikleri cinsel bir soru. 
E, zamandan da e, tasarruf etmek için bu büyük konuyu aslında üç ana bölüme bölelim bence. I can divide these three topics uh, into three topics. Ecosystem. First of all, we have to understand the ecosystem. The second one is the new business models and their impacts on the human beings. Well, when I say ecosystem, I am trying to evaluate this from the consumer perspective. Well, this is a, a big share. The global, 60% of the global GDP is actually being spent to the consumer products. It's a big market. And this market is growing each uh, passing day. Every day when we wake up, there is more digital data and new technologies and new solutions. AI. IoT, AI, VR, blockchain, robotics, 3D printing and such kind of new technologies are popping up every day. And in such an environment, change is inevitable. In 2050, for example, in this planet, 10 billion people will live and 65% of them will be living in the big cities and they will have an access to the mobile internet and the expectation for such a world is as follows. In the upcoming 10 years, the change in the consumer world will be more than the change that has happened uh, 40 years ago. For example, 10 years ago, there wasn't even iPhone. So it is a, uh, it's going to be a drastic change. And the business models will be changing radically because uh, new business models are actually occurring because of the digital uh, transformation. With the fourth industrial revolution, physical, biological, and uh, among uh, the borders are actually vanishing in those world, worlds. Amazon, the biggest e-commerce uh, company, for example, is buying supermarket chain and they are being present in our physical world. And they are also changing the behaviors of the consumers. Alibaba.com, for example, can, say, uh, on, can uh, sell online $25 billion in one day. And uh, I mean, certain uh, companies are uh, presenting tailor-made solutions with uh, very cost-effective uh, prices to the consumers. We are speaking about blockchain and there are lots of developments in the agriculture sector and peer-to-peer -peer energy distribution, for example, is a new solution. I mean, such kind of solutions that you have never thought about is actually occurring. And this cyclical economy that they are calling there is this shared economy inside it. There are these uh, reproducible pr uh, products and the performance-based uh, pricing are the concepts. And this economy is also uh, developing. Shared economy was a $15 billion of market. And by 2025 or 2030, they are expected to reach out to 335 uh, billion dollars of market volume. So there will be an exponential growth. Well, these new technologies are very good, but how we can actually solve the problems of the human beings and how we can actually develop uh, new business models. The human beings are quite important in this uh, process. We are the consumers, we are the producers, we are the workers. Let's start with the producer part. Let's speak about food. 33% of the food is actually wasted in the global sense. Well, this is a huge waste. If we can use technology like blockchain and different technologies, we can actually prevent such kind of waste and many people are in poverty these days. As you said, in retail, for example, there is this CPG for the uh, CPG products, the, the uh, labor force will be changing because of automation. I don't say that these people will uh, actually lose their jobs, but in time there will be expectations uh, for new type of skills. We are consumers at the same time, and this uh, 10 year will be very bright because we have the control. We can actually take a look to the name, to the packaging, to the price, uh, to the location of the product and we will be the decision maker. So it is also a, a good hope for us. In order to satisfy the expectations uh, of the consumers, the entrepreneurs, 
uh, will be most probably gaining uh, the ground. Let me give you one more example. Millennium uh, generation. Over 90% of the new generation, by the way, are choosing those products if those products are using new technologies and innovations and if it is actually serving to the needs uh, of their customers. So the consumers are quite aware and people are trying to measure it and trying to put them into action. And this will be an important development which will increase the quality and it creates such a good benchmark. Thank you. Uh, Peter. Um, you talk very well about the, uh, where the future will be in 10, 20, 30 years time, but what can go wrong? What might be the impediments to that? What might be the, you know, in terms of regulation uh, or any other, anything you see uh, as sort of getting in the way of that vision? I was going to talk about how it impacts all these industries in the room and, and what you need to change today, but I'll talk about what can go wrong. Um, just to change the... Uh, <laughs> just the optimism. No, actually, <laughs> it, it's true. Sometimes when you listen to people like us, it sounds like everything is great and everything's going to go easy and there's not going to be any issues. Of course there are going to be issues. Of course it's not going to be easy. Um, so one of the things we're seeing and getting a lot of questions about are some of the ethical issues around autonomous vehicles. Uh, recently there was an accident in Arizona, you might have read about it, a woman unfortunately was killed by an autonomous vehicle. They're now investigating, the facts will come out. But what remains is we as societies will have to decide over time as computers are doing more and more tasks for us and things for us, who sets the rules, who sets the boundaries for what's acceptable and not. I personally believe that societies and in Europe, pan-national uh, institutions will set the rules that dictate which choices are machines allowed to make and which choices are humans uh, encouraged and forced to make. So some of the things that can go wrong or some of the things that we'll have to, to deal with is this new kind of, of ethical and, and regulatory decision making and we'll have to start considering concepts like, well, maybe it's not a person making a choice when something has to happen. Maybe it's an algorithm. But guess what? Algorithms are making choices for us every single day. And our friends from Facebook or from in the bank, there's technology that's basically deciding what is presented to us or things that we can act upon. And the same thing will happen in mobility. Um, if I can just spare two seconds sure, on something please. positive. Yeah. So, the, the, the challenge I think people that are not in automotive and not in transport will have is to start thinking about what happens when vehicles are moving by themselves, both with humans and with logistics. The OECD did a study on Lisbon in Portugal, and they basically analyzed, and they said, what happens if we take all the regular cars and all the regular trucks that are on the road today and replace them with two types of vehicles. One is an autonomous shuttle that fit 15 people, the kind of stuff that I work with, and one is an on-demand robo-taxi, kind of like Uber, but without a driver. They did a simulation of Lisbon, and what they came up with is startling. They found out that all street parking could be eliminated. So all the cars that are parked along the side of the road, gone. Eighty percent of the parking structures the parking houses that you also have here in Istanbul and, and here in Bursa, 80% of those gone. To me, that's great news because it means that we can get more space in the cities to live, to have green areas, to build schools, to build housing, to have businesses where people want to be. But if you're in commercial real estate, if you're in the cement business, if you're in the insurance business and the cars don't hit each other anymore, uh, if you're in the financial services business, uh, and people don't finance or lease their cars anymore. There's tons of businesses that are being affected by the fact, the simple fact, that we're not driving our cars anymore. So as you listen to me think very optimistically about all the positive change, I'd encourage you to go home and look at your own business and saying, what do we make money on today that is affected by the fact that vehicles don't need to stand still and that people don't need to own them? What happens to the business that I'm in when this happens, because it will happen. I'll stop there.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's, uh, and thanks for dealing with the, uh, the curveball, as it well. Very, uh, so, see, this is why human beings will always be better than machines, because we can think on our feet uh, more robustly. So thank you for that. Thomas, we're going to give you the final word. As a futurist, um, uh, expert in artificial intelligence, um, how should we think about the future? Where is this going to go? Peter gave some uh, consequences of uh, of what will happen in the uh, autonomous uh, mobility in, in, in automotive uh, Hakan Bay on, in, in terms of blockchain and what it's going to mean for financial services. But generally, where is this going to go? And when we think about the world of work and culture, about how people will earn money, earn a living, um, value uh, creation, how is this going to evolve in, in, in your view? Yeah, uh, as I s said before, um, we tend to think it's an either-or situation where it's more of a both-and. So by 2030, the, the wealthiest artists are going, and the musicians are going to be ones that are using AI to help produce their works. It's AI-enhanced musicians and artists that are going to dominate the art scene. Um, I gave a talk in Antalya, Turkey, uh, in 2013 for the Turkish Post, uh, there was a, uh, uh, they asked me to come and give a talk on the future of the Postal Service um, and this whole idea of delivering packages and all that. And I, I started off my talk with this one central question of how long would it be before somebody can mail a package and say Istanbul and it arrive on the other side of the world, let's say San Francisco, without ever touching any human hands. So we can put information into a computer and it gets routed around and it comes out over here. How long before we can put a package into the system and it gets routed around and comes out over here? Um, so I wrote a column recently on this idea of the self-delivering package, one that you can just set out in front of your house um, and then take a picture with a special app on it that take a picture and then uh, a robot will come and pick up your package and then deliver it to the other side of the world. Um, and then it, nobody ever has to humanly handle that package. Th that's, that's coming, but that's, that's an example of transitioning from national systems to global systems. And, and artificial intelligence is going to lead to lots of interesting new global systems. Um, so artificial intelligence, think of it as... Uh, AI as a service, it'll be in the cloud, and so we can add pieces of intelligence to everything around us. We can make all these things smarter and more efficient, everything that we're doing, but we're going to need um, some uh, more universal Wi-Fi, uh, universal computing power that, uh, that ties everything together. So we're still, we're still too segmented, we, we haven't got that whole network uh, laid out just yet. Now, naturally, with AI, people are going to figure out how to use it wrong. Um, sometime, <clears throat> I'm speculating that later on this year, we will, we will start hearing about the first incident of weaponized AI. Um, now, this isn't AI trying to take over the world, the stuff that Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates and Elon Musk is talking about. This is the stuff where we have devious hackers that are figuring out how to bilk money out of people and how to create chaos, and, um, and it, it, it'll be much more than that, though, because it can be used in targeted ways. It can be used to target um, uh, uh, different races of people, different countries, different companies, different religions, different associations, and it can be used just to create chaos, or it can create intimidation engines to intimidate people, to blackmail them, everybody cares about something. And it doesn't take too long to go online and you can figure out what somebody cares about. Um, but these engines will go in and figure out how to disrupt society, how to cross friction between government and the citizens and, and try to create uh, chaos and mayhem. This is, I think, a transition in, in the whole nature of war because why, why do you have to invest in a billion dollar um, war machines when you can just invest in AI and uh, it doesn't cost near as much to create way more chaos and havoc. 
Well, on that uh, uh, note. On that positive note, yes. <laughs> time is up. I'm going to give, uh, I, I, I have to finish on a good note, Dan. You got to, uh, if I was uh, 19 years old, again, coming into the world uh, of uh, digital world or whatever, uh, as you are with your history, what would you advise somebody today? Areas to, um, to pursue? Or, yes, or just uh, uh, to make it? Um, well, uh, the, the topic I've been immersed in the last year is blockchain technologies. I'm an advisor for three blockchain startups. And Murat, you mentioned one of the areas, which is uh, uh, decentralized energy sales. I think that's a fascinating idea. And uh, I'm also an, an advisor for Proppy, which is uh, blockchain for real estate transactions. And they've sold their first property here in Europe. Um, AR, VR, huge topic, growth area. Uh, voice interface, which involves AI. Uh, we didn't that wasn't really mentioned. Um, I would have mentioned graphical information systems, which is transformed so much of our lives, the mapping functions. Um, maybe that's enough. Great. Well, on that uh, more optimistic note, I would like to thank our uh, panel. Thanks, Thomas, uh, Peter, Morat, Akan Bey, uh, Daria, and, and Dan. Uh, I think it was a great session. And now, uh, Afiat Olsen. Have a good lunch. Uh. Arch, thank you for your contributions. Değerli konuklarımız, evet panelistlerimize çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Hepiniz öğle yemeğine gitmek istiyorsunuz. Tabii ki başlayabiliriz. 14.20'de burada buluşmak dileğiyle. Afiyet olsun tekrar.